Welcome. Our first hymn for today is hymn 763 from the worship supplement. This particular hymn is a little less familiar and maybe more challenging in its tune, so you may want to sing it from the hymnal instead of just from the projection. We sing. The Apostle Paul once said, we must go through many troubles on our way to the kingdom of God. The idea was this, that right now we're here, and heaven is over here, and in between there are going to be some hard times. But our readings for today aren't about persecution or trouble. Think of Paul's image of a Christian's life again. Right now we're here, heaven is here, and in between, well, there's going to be more than just hard times. There's going to be spiritual growth. There's going to be joy in the Lord. There are going to be fruits of faith which flower and ripen. If these things aren't there, if there is no growth or no joy in the Lord or no fruits of faith, then we might need to ask ourselves, what road am I on? Is this the road that leads to heaven? Is this the narrow way of my Savior? In our readings for today, you will find the pattern of a Christian's life. First, we come to know Christ. We come to faith in Him. And there our sins are forgiven. Then comes change in our souls and growth as we move down the path toward Christ's return and His final rescue. Look for that pattern in our readings for today. Healing, change, 
final salvation. We pray. Heavenly Father, King David wrote, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Fill us with this same gladness when we come to worship you. Make us eager to hear your word, to sing your praises, and to lift up our hearts to you in prayer. In this hour, bless us by your Holy Spirit so that we are refreshed after all of our toiling and burdens, the sins and the failures of daily life. Teach us to approach you with reverence, with a heart that is truly sorry over our sin. And when we leave this place of worship, cause us to take with us the knowledge that our sins have been forgiven because of Jesus. Fill our souls with the peace which the world cannot give. Amen. Our order of worship is the first setting in the worship supplement on page one. Please rise. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved of God, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we confess that we are sinful by nature and have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions. We have not loved you above all things. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Have mercy on us, and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us our sins. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has sent his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our prayers have been requested on this weekend for Ruth Gullerud, who received stitches on her face after a fall in which she hit her head. She doesn't appear to have a concussion, 
and is back at Care Partners, where she currently resides, recovering there. We also pray for Jeff Johnson, who was hospitalized earlier this week with intestinal complications connected with past cancer treatments. He is recovering at home, but we don't know what surgery or treatments may be needed going forward. We come before our Father's throne. Heavenly Father, give Ruth Gullerud thorough healing and soften any pain that she is feeling. Give her renewed peace in her soul, a soul that rests in Christ Jesus, and pour new joy into this daughter of yours. Lord, please give Jeff Johnson clarity of mind. If there is something you wish to teach him or uncover for him in this struggle, help him to understand that. Give Jeff renewed peace in Christ and contentment because he can face all things through the strength that you provide. Renew his hope and encourage his family. Lord God, you are light, and in you there is no darkness at all. You see into the deepest, darkest corners of our heart. You know us. Help us to be open and honest before you and with all people. Root out any and all hypocrisy that has begun to grow up in us and make us to worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. We pray these things to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for you are one God, our maker, redeemer, and sanctifier, who lives and reigns now and forever. Please be seated. Our first reading from the Lord's Word comes from the Gospel of John. We read from chapter 5. After this, there was a Jewish festival, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethesda in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, who were waiting for the movement of the water. For an angel would go down at certain times into the pool and stir up the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. One man was there who had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been sick a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the sick man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. While I'm going, someone else goes down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly the man was healed. He picked up his mat and walked. That day was the Sabbath. So the Jews told the man who had been healed, This is the Sabbath. You are not permitted to carry your mat. He answered them, The one who made me well told me, Pick up your mat and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who told you, Pick it up and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Look, you are well now. Do not sin any more so that nothing worse may happen to you. Our second reading comes from Paul's letter to Timothy, a young pastor, his first letter to Timothy. We read from chapter 1. I give thanks to the one who empowered me, namely Christ Jesus our Lord, that he treated me as trustworthy, appointing me into his ministry, he did this even though formerly I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. But I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. The grace of our Lord overflowed on me along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy 
and worthy of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But I was shown mercy for this reason, that in me, the worst sinner, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his unlimited patience as an example for those who are going to believe in him, resulting in eternal life. Now, to the King, eternal, to the immortal, invisible, only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. These are our readings for today. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. We now profess our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. Please rise. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We now install our Sunday school teachers and our newest member of the ministry team. Those being installed, please come forward. Congregation may be seated. The people who stand before you have been called to serve as teachers in our Sunday school and have signified their willingness to serve. Paul Schaller has been called to serve as part-time teacher or part-time preacher and coordinator for our worship services. Both teachers and preachers have a serious responsibility toward God and the flock that they serve, whether they are instructing the lambs of Christ's flock or equipping and encouraging the flock as a whole. Either way, thorough and thoughtful study of God's Word will be required. Prayer will be needed 
both for yourselves and for those that you are teaching. Let your diligent example be one that prompts others to honor the Lord. You are taking on a serious responsibility, but the Lord has promised that he will be with you and that he will supply the gifts that are needed for this task. And so, teachers and preacher, on behalf of Messiah Congregation and before God, I ask you, are you willing to accept the responsibilities placed upon you and to do your work faithfully according to the ability that God gives? If so, answer, yes, with the help of God. Yes, with the help of God. Will you teach the flock according to God's word and according to his word alone? If so, answer, I will. I will. I will. Will you do your work in a way that serves as a good example of one who is dedicated to living out the things that they teach? If so, answer, I will, with the help of God. I will, with the help of God. Upon these solemn promises, we acknowledge you as teachers in Messiah Lutheran Sunday School program and as a preacher in our ministry team. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. May God grant you his Holy Spirit and give you wisdom and strength to fulfill your task to his glory and toward the spiritual welfare of many souls. We pray. Gracious Savior, help us to raise up our children to know you. Give wisdom, discretion, kindness, and perseverance to all who conduct schools for the instructing of the young. Teach them that they may teach others. Help the children that we serve to be humble, teachable, and ready to learn all that comes from your word. And when your whole congregation hears your word preached, help us to accept that word eagerly. Build us up in the faith, both preachers and hearers, so that our lives are transformed. Your name is glorified among us, and the gospel is proclaimed that many souls may be saved. Amen. We now sing hymn 342. You may be seated.
Grace and peace be yours from God our Father and from our ascended and ever reigning Savior, Jesus Christ. One of the joys of the pastoral ministry is doing adult instruction classes. This is the truth. Pastors get to sit down with individuals or couples or sometimes even families and we get to study the Bible together. Sometimes you get to teach someone who has a lot of Bible knowledge already. Sometimes you get to teach someone who has just a little and sometimes someone who has none at all. Those are really the best. You get to give that person what they don't have. You get to lay before them the words and promises of the Lord, the Lord who created them and loved them enough to send His Son to take away their sin. I want to tell you today about one class I had with a man many years ago. He was a bit rough. He had very little knowledge of the Bible. So I said to explaining the gospel to him that in order to take away the sins of mankind, God sent his eternal son, Jesus, to become human like us, and that he lived a life unlike any that we could ever live, one without sin. And then he gave his life on the cross to rescue us all, to take our sins away. At some point, I explained that if a person believes this, they're brought to faith in this message, then they're a Christian. Becoming, becoming a follower of Christ doesn't come with a, a bunch of hoops to jump through. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died to take away the sins of the world, including yours, then heaven is open to you. You belong to Christ. Well, that's it the man said, well, then I'm already a Christian. But I don't know that he was. Why do I say that? Well, there was a shallowness in his spirituality, kind of like saying that, you know, well, I believe God exists, makes you religious. It doesn't. I doubt that this man ever talked to anyone about Jesus. Reading God's Word or hearing it read in worship definitely was not a priority in his life. His words and his actions pointed to a devotion to himself above all things rather than a devotion to God. There are plenty of people in this world who, believe, who say that they believe in God and yet then they go on living their lives without this faith changing really anything in their lives. They say they believe in God, but this shallow belief doesn't alter any of the things that they, that they say or do. Now, there's some danger here in speaking like this. We don't want to judge someone's faith in Jesus saying, well, maybe you'll become a Christian once you get to this certain level of holiness in your life. That's not what the Bible says. When a person hears the message of sins forgiven through Jesus, the Holy Spirit can, through that single proclamation of the gospel, bring that person to faith. And that person may have all sorts of wrong understandings in their head about God, wrong understandings that the Holy Spirit has on his list to change in that person. But their infant faith is still faith. The weakest faith in Christ still saves completely. This is the remarkable truth about the gospel. In it, we hear about God's free forgiveness given to us through Christ's work, not our own, received through faith in Him. And this forgiveness is completely free, the Bible tells us. It covers our sin immediately and completely. And as long as we shelter under Christ by faith in all that He did in our place, this forgiveness lasts forever. 
It doesn't wear out. Forgiveness through Christ is so accessible and free and valuable that sinners are easily tempted to abuse it. Oh, I can get that anytime. Oh, yeah, I don't really need to have anything to do with God or His Word in my daily life, but I'm still covered because I know Jesus is my Savior. Forgiveness is free and all. But hear these words from the mouth of Jesus, from Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Outward religiousness isn't faith in the triune God. This is the warning that God levels on the people of Israel in our sermon reading for today. It is a warning to us all to evaluate ourselves, to ask, Am I just going through the religious motions? Is my faith just a show for others to see? And if it is, then I need to ask God to change me so that I worship Him from the heart, in spirit and in truth. Our sermon reading is verses 14 through 23 from Psalm 50. But before we read that, I'd like to summarize the beginning verses of Psalm 50. In this psalm, first, God comes down with fire and surrounded with a storm, and he calls his people Israel to gather before him and to to stand for judgment because he's going to testify against them. But not because Israel has been neglecting to offer sacrifices at the temple. No, they've been doing that quite a bit. The problem is not one of bulls and birds and goats. The problem is that their their hearts are not dedicated to the Lord. We read from Psalm 50, verses 14 through 23. Sacrifice a thank offering to God. And fulfill your vows to the Most High. Call on me in the day of distress. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. But to the wicked, God says, What right do you have to recite my statutes or to take up my covenant with your mouth? As for you, you hate discipline. You throw my words behind your back. If you see a thief, you approve of him and you cast your lot with adulterers. You devote your mouth to evil, and your tongue weaves deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought I was just like you. I will indict you and accuse you to your face. Now consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you to pieces, and there will be no one to rescue you. The one who sacrifices a thank offering honors me, and he sets up the way by which I will show him the salvation of God. These are the words May the Holy Spirit bless our study of them. Amen. To begin with, I'm going to back up and read those first two verses so we can unpack them. Sacrifice a thank offering to God and fulfill your vows to the Most High. Call on me in the day of distress. I will deliver you and you will honor me. In the Old Testament temple of the Lord, there were 
five basic types of sacrifices that might be brought there. And under one of these categories was something called the thank offering. Now, the thank offering was a voluntary offering. That is, it wasn't required. God didn't say, you must bring this sacrifice once a year or ten times a year or anything like that. What would happen is this. When a follower of the Lord received an unexpected blessing from God's hand, that person might bring a special thank offering to the temple to say thank you to God for that unexpected blessing. Under this same category was the vow offering. This was also a voluntary thing. It wasn't required. But a person could pray to God about something and then connect a vow to that prayer. Here's how it might work. A person might say, God, please bless my fields with a large harvest this year. And if you make this year's harvest larger than last year's harvest, I vow to give 20% of that harvest to the poor. Now, I'm not sure how many Christians today make vows like this. It's an interesting act of worship. At the, beginning, at the beginning, it expresses your dependence on God. You're saying, Lord, this is something that I'm asking of you, and I can't do it for myself. You have to provide this. And then, at the end of this kind of worship, there's a, a voluntary, self-designated commitment that allows the worshiper to exercise their faith by keeping the promise that they made to God. Worship that utilizes a vow is mentioned in the book of Ecclesiastes, where Solomon writes, When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it, for he takes no delight in fools. Fulfill whatever you have vowed. Better that you do not vow than that you do make a vow and do not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say to the temple official that the vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry because of what you say and ruin the work your hands have done? That's from Ecclesiastes 5. If a person made a deal with God and then God delivered the blessing and then that person ducked out of the deal, that wouldn't be an act of faith. That would be an act of sin. No, taking... The taking of vows was an act of worship only when those vows were kept. With the first words of our sermon reading, God tells his people, I want you to worship from the heart. Let your religion not just be one of going through the motions, doing what is required of you, but let it be one of loving, thankful interaction with your Lord. Sacrifice a thank offering to God and fulfill your vows to the Most High. Call on me in the day of distress. I will deliver you and you will honor me. We can even see that vow offering mirrored in that verse 15 there. Call on me. I will deliver you. Then you will honor me with the keeping of your vow. This is a lot different than the shallow, oh, I believe God exists type of religion. This was one way that a true follower of the Lord might express their trust in the Lord's promises. And in a way, it was even mimicking God's pattern of giving the gospel. In the Garden of Eden, God promised Adam and Eve that he would send them a savior to rescue them from sin. And then in time, he kept that promise. How fitting it is that, that God's followers might worship him following that same pattern of making a promise to God and then fulfilling that promise. But among the Israelites that were called before God in this psalm, 
There were false brothers, people that God would testify against. We read verses 16 through 20 again. But to the wicked, God says, what right do you have to recite my statutes or to take up my covenant with your mouth? As for you, you hate discipline, and you throw my words behind your back. If you see a thief, you approve of him, and you cast your lot with adulterers. You devote your mouth to evil, and your tongue weaves deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was just like you. I will indict you and accuse you to your face. Now consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you to pieces, and there will be no one to rescue you. We're not used to hearing God speak like this, are we? This is law. Law that God uses to sift through the souls of mankind to find what impurities are there. Now, it's true that we're all sinners. We know that. None of us are sinless if judged by our own thoughts and words and actions. But when God speaks of the wicked here, he also calls them those who forget God. He doesn't just mean sinners. He's speaking to unbelievers, hypocrites like the Pharisees of Jesus' day, who he said were like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but on the inside full of every kind of uncleanness, righteous looking in their churchiness, but full of hypocrisy and wickedness. In Psalm 50, God says of the wicked, they have no right to claim any connection to him. They don't even listen to him. They approve of evil. They do evil. They speak evil, even against their own close family. And not just accidentally. Their mouth is devoted to evil. Their tongue weaves deceit. That's not an accident. And when they did all these things, God simply looked on. And when he didn't immediately crash down in judgment on the wicked for their evils, they thought that meant that God approved that he was like them. But no. Listen to what the Apostle Peter wrote in his second letter. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. For the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. In other words, time doesn't have an effect on the Lord. The Lord is not slow to do what he promised, as some consider slowness. Instead, he is patient for your sakes, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. That's from 2 Peter 3. In the book of Hebrews, the Bible calls God a consuming fire. And here in Psalm 50, God tells the wicked, I will tear you to pieces and there will be no one to rescue you. No savior for you on that day. But this consuming fire, this just and terrifying God, the Bible also calls him the God of all patience and comfort. The God who doesn't want any to perish, but all to turn away from their sin to the Savior who has redeemed them. And this is why God inspired Asaph to write this psalm, to call the hypocrites in the assembly of Israel to repentance, to healing, to rescue, to free, immediate, all covering an eternal forgiveness that is found in Christ Jesus. Can you imagine the first time this psalm was used in worship in Israel? 
At the time of King David, it would have been. That's when Asaph, the writer of this psalm, lived. Can you imagine the people gathering together in the temple and hearing this rebuke from the Lord, this call to repentance? I imagine some of them went home pondering, searching their souls. And we too will do the same. That is the point of the psalm, a call to examine our hearts. Will we see a self-righteous and wicked person? Or will we see the leveled, humbled soul of a sinner who looks up from the ground to the cross of Christ for their only hope, but their sure and certain hope? Sometimes when we search our soul to see if we belong to God or not, the devil likes to ask us a question. Sometimes when God's thundering law shakes us, he says, well, maybe you're not really a Christian. Maybe you think you believe in Jesus, but you don't trust in him, not really. And we have to consider this, don't we? But here's how to answer that question. Do you believe, like the Bible says, that Jesus was a real, live, breathing man who lived some 2,000 years ago? Yes. Do you believe that, like the Bible says, Jesus Christ was also the eternal Son of God through whom all things were made? Yes. Do you believe, like the Bible says, that Jesus lived without sin, suffered hell in your place, and died your death? Because that's what the Bible says. Do you believe that? Yes. Then you belong to Him. And in Christ your sins stand forgiven. For the devil cannot change what Jesus did for us. He cannot undo that historical fact. The final words of today's psalm read, The one who sacrifices a thank offering honors me, and he sets up the way by which I will show him the salvation of God. Let me read that again. The one who sacrifices a thank offering honors me, and he sets up the way by which I will show him the salvation of God. I think what these final words of Psalm 50 mean is this. That those who have faith will produce fruits of faith. And to them, God will show his salvation. That is, in the end, he will give them what he has promised them. Eternal life in Christ Jesus. He will give them what they have longed for and what they have clung to. I'm going to end our sermon time today with the final verses from a different psalm, from Psalm 91, verses 14 through 16. Hear these words. The Lord says, because he clings to me, I will rescue him. I will protect him because he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in distress. I will deliver him, and I will honor him. With long life I will satisfy him, and I will let him see my salvation. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.
we sing our next hymn. Please be seated.
pray. Father in heaven, we praise you above all, for you are our creator and provider. You have provided forgiveness of sins through the work of your Son and countless other spiritual blessings. Preserve our faith in Christ through the gospel word and through the life-giving sacraments of baptism and holy communion. Continue to preserve your word and keep your people in the faith through the faithful preaching and teaching of that word. Through your people, your church, proclaim that message to all sinners. With mercy and compassion, gather more and more broken sinners like us into your eternal family. Protect those in danger, Lord, and move them to see that it is your strong arm that has done the protecting. Help us to bear whatever crosses you give us to bear in this life. And in the end, let us see your glory and your wisdom and love in it all. Be gracious to our nation, Lord, and to the nations of the world. Fill our nation with mercy, truth, righteousness, and peace. Guard our schools so that they may help us to raise godly children. Cause our schools to be places to plant and further develop the talents and abilities that you have given to each child. And help all of us to use our gifts to lift up your name in this world. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Because of you, we are free from sin, citizens of heaven, and heirs of eternal life. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all praise and honor and glory and power are yours forever and ever. And so we pray as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. During the final hymn, the second weekend of the month, we offer the Lord's Supper again to those communicant members of Messiah Lutheran and communicant members of our sister congregations in the CLC. We hear again the words of institution. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. As is our custom, the first table will be made up of those communicant members who are using the communion kits. If you have those, please take out the bread. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. And when you are ready, take and drink. This cup is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Now may this true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the true Christian faith unto life everlasting. Be at peace. Communicants coming forward may do so now using the inner aisle on the right side and the inner aisle on the left.
receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Good morning again. In the bulletin, there are announcements as usual, and there's more details about the following. Uh, this week, Ruth's Retreat, which is our relaxed uh, high school Bible study, happens again on Wednesday. We have been invited to meet at Ruth's house again instead of in the library uh, at the Academic Center. So that's exciting. High school students, please join us. The Board of Property plans to re-roof the teacherage, which is right over here, on Friday and Saturday, and would love help doing that. And EHV Bibles uh, that we had for the congregation, uh, those sold out, but the deacons have made additional copies available uh, to get at that discounted price. Those are in the, uh, by the pastor's offices just off of the narthex there. In about 15 minutes, we'll continue with Bible class. Uh, we're studying the minor prophet Hosea. And of course, there's Sunday school down the hall for the youth and young adults. Bible study uh, for high school is going to be meeting up here. We also have received uh, a letter from Pastor David Pfeiffer, who was considering the call to serve as our third pastor. He writes, Dear members of Messiah, grace and peace to, to you all. After prayer and reflection, I've decided to return the call you've extended to me. In the process of deliberating, it has become clear to me that I should continue my calling at Holy Trinity. This has been a very helpful exercise for me and our congregation as we depend on the Lord. I pray that the same is true for you. In considering your call, I can see that there is much need and opportunity within your midst. Overseeing such a large church requires dedication and a lot of volunteer support. The gospel is surely showing its fruit of your labors. I can also see how there is a pressing need for a third pastor to help ease the load on those carrying it. I will be praying for your pastors and leadership. I will be praying for you all that the Lord is able to encourage you through your fellowship together. May the Lord grant you strength and patience as you work through this time. May he support you all in the diverse work of his kingdom, teaching you to rely on him more and more. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. In the name of Christ our Lord, David Pfeiffer. Uh, in connection with this, President Oster has announced a call meeting for September uh, 17th at 6.30 p.m. That's um, usually we have them after Bible class, um, but this one is going to be in the evening at 6.30. Uh, this will be a call meeting, and some membership matters will also be taken care of. May the grace of the Lord go with each of you. Mm -hmm.